Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our online service this morning. I trust that you're keeping well, uh, that you're encouraged and that you feel uh, blessed by our time of fellowship uh, this morning. Uh, Emma's chosen our songs this morning and they'll be available uh, online as usual. And this morning, Anthony is our speaker and he's going to continue our series titled What's So Great About God? And this morning's answer is God is good. I won't reveal the full answer. I'll let him do that. Um, but yeah, so we look forward to that. Um, before we get to that uh, and a few other things, I wonder if you've seen anything interesting on your daily walks. That is, if they are still daily walks, maybe they're a little bit less frequent now the weather's turned. Our walks tend to take a pretty similar route every time. We always pass this one house. And for the past couple of weeks, almost every time we see the same scene through the window. There's a couple that that's we are kind of peering into people's windows. So <laughs> I'd be alarmed if, if we come walking past your house. So there's this couple that seem to be hunched over a dining room table, attempting to find the next piece of what I can only assume is a very large and complicated jigsaw puzzle. To me, any puzzling is pretty puzzling. But what if the whole world, so the mountains, ocean, trees, flowers, sky, animal, birds, insects, people, what if all that was a puzzle that you had to put together? Oh, and there's one other thing as well. It's not a normal puzzle. It's one of those complex 3D puzzles with all those moving pieces. Imagine if you had to add layer upon layer to your puzzle to piece together each person along with every circumstance that they would ever face. That's pretty unimaginable. In Psalm 104 verse 24, it says, O oh Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom, have you made them all? God is infinitely wise. This means he causes everything to work out perfectly. It's as if the world is like a giant puzzle with millions of pieces. God made each piece and all the pieces fit together in order to make the world just as God planned it. God doesn't make any mistakes because he is wise. Everything turns out exactly as he planned it. When we look at our lives at the moment, uh, all the different difficult situations that need to be made, looking at our country at the moment, often all we can see is a mountain of puzzle pieces that don't seem to fit together at all. We need to trust God at the moment, trust that he's infinitely wise in each detail of our lives, and especially when thing, bad things happen and circumstances don't seem to make sense at all. God knows the best goal in every situation. He also has total and perfect knowledge of billions and billions of relevant factors in every situation that enable him to know the best way to achieve the goal. So my prayer this week for all of us is that we ask God for wisdom in all decisions and circumstances we face. And maybe the next time you sit down at a puzzle, maybe it won't be until Christmas time, but if you have a think about who the master puzzle maker is, who's the one that creates and fits everything together to reveal his perfect plan in creation and achieve his goals. So uh, this morning, um, Steve is going to lead us in prayer together and um, Tim is gonna bring us our reading. So I'll hand over to Steve uh, to, to, to pray. Yeah, let's pray. Uh, Father God, thank you that we can uh, we can focus on you this morning. Thank you that we can all um, just think about how great and wonderful and mighty you are. Father, I thank you that everything is in your hands. I thank you that you are in control of every situation. You are all powerful. You are everywhere. You are all knowledgeable. You know everything. I thank you that you are good and faithful, that you are trustworthy and true and we can place our lives in your hand and know that you are in control and that with you um you're never taken by surprise you're never 
you're never shocked by anything uh, and we can trust you we can we can rest in you father i pray as a people that we will at this time rest in you and how great and magnificent and awesome you are father i pray that this morning you'll give us another vision of how great you are as we think about your goodness as we think about your trustworthiness as we think about you i pray that we will glorify you which is the end goal of everything that we will glorify you and give you the the majesty and the worship that you deserve father we pray for um we pray for our government that you give them wisdom that you'll give them um the ability to make good decisions decisions that glorify you uh decisions that um you can use for your glory father we pray uh for our nhs we thank you for them father we thank you for our key workers we thank you for all those people that are working so hard in difficult situations uh, just to keep things going to keep people safe and father we just ask uh for your glory in what is an incredibly difficult uh and painful situation for a lot of people Father, we pray for Anthony this morning that you'll give him uh, just real clarity of thought uh, and word as he speaks your words to us. I pray that, Father, we will be ready to hear what you have to say and that you will impact our lives, impact our hearts, so that we leave this morning's meeting changed, challenged to glorify you and make much of you and to praise you because of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Morning. So this morning's reading is Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever, you, whoever of you lo loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks, Steve, for praying as well. Um, now, Miriam has um, kindly put together uh, some prayer points for us uh, in the form of a video to particularly focus on praying about the school situation at this time. Um, it's obviously proving particularly uh, troubling for a lot of people in, in our fellowship for various different reasons. Um, so let's view that video together and then afterwards we'll have a time of open, uh, open prayer focusing um, on those prayer points uh, which I'll lead us in. Uh, so, Anthony, if you could kindly play the video, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Miriam and I'm a primary school teacher. I work in a local school to our church. 
James and Anthony have just asked me to give you a few prayer points to help you pray really specifically in this situation for us in school. Firstly, please pray for our pupils, the ones that are in school, where school is completely different to normal, where we are two metres apart and we can't do everything we normally would and we can't be quite as friendly as we normally were and children can't come as close to us. So to help them it's a bit more of a challenge. So school's quite different for them. Please also pray for those children who are at home, where home maybe isn't the safest of places, and for those children who are just being homeschooled and they're quite enjoying it, some of them, but they are missing their friends a lot of the time. So please pray that children would make the most of this situation and wouldn't feel too frightened. Please also pray for parents. I think they're in a really challenging situation at the moment, most of them working from home and homeschooling and also now making the really tough decision about whether their children are going to return to school or whether they're going to stay at home. So please pray for wisdom of parents and for their understanding of teachers at this time. Please pray for teachers and for support staff and for office staff and kitchen staff, anyone that is in school at the moment. It's a very strange situation. We're all adapting the way we teach so we're directing children's learning at home we are caring for key workers children in school and often we're looking after our own children at home at the same time teachers are quite worried at the moment particularly in with regard to opening schools back up in june we would really value your prayers for wisdom so that we can make good decisions about how many children we have when we have them in and just please pray that our fears would be relieved and that we would feel safe and happy in school and that we can provide the best environment and the best teaching for those children. And lastly, I'd love you to pray for those who are the decision makers, the government, the head teachers, the local authorities, those people that are giving us guidelines and guidance to show what to do. Please help them make good decisions. And if it is right that we come back on June the 1st, help those decision makers to make the best decision to help us to get them back in the best way. Thank you for praying, Beacon, and I'll see you very soon. That's great. And um, thanks for that, Miriam. Um, I think it's a, when I watched it, it's a really good insight into the situation around our schools at the moment. Um, and I think it helps us really focus our prayers um, as we look for, for guidance from God on, on this situation. Um, so let's have a time of open prayer together. Um, if anyone wishes to pray, uh, you'll need to unmute yourself and try to remember to remute uh, yourself afterwards. Um, and then I'll bring uh, the, the time of prayer together at the close when it's appropriate. Uh, so let's pray together. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We thank you, you are the God of all gods, the one to whom we can turn in every situation, knowing your wisdom and your love, and your power. So we bless you and thank you this morning for being with us. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do pray at this time for the schools, Lord, for the people who will make the decisions about how and when they should return. We pray, Lord, for the vulnerable children and the children of key workers who will find school a strange environment without the friendliness, without the colourfulness, with being separated, Lord. And we pray if the schools do go back, Lord, we we pray that you would guard children and their mental health, Lord, um, when they go back and school isn't as it was and um, isn't how it should be. 
Lord, we pray that you would protect our teachers and all the staff, Miriam mentioned, key workers, office workers, kitchen workers, Lord. Would you guard them about and would you keep them safe um, physically and mentally and emotionally, Lord. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Dear, dear Lord, as you pray for um, guidance from the government and, and Lord, pray that you just um, bless the people who are on the front line and stuff. Lord, pray for um, Dave Woods and um, Dave Berry and people who are working. Lord, pray that you just bless them and keep them safe from it as well, Lord. Lord, pray that you just bless the schools. Lord, pray that you just um, give the teachers give the teachers guidance to um, what, what they make plans for. Lord, pray that you just bless Miriam as she, as she um, helps out, Lord. Lord, pray that she'll have the faith in you to sort things out, Lord. Lord, pray for the government, the government Lord, pray that they might make right decisions about what to do, Lord. Lord, pray that as we, as we um, Stay safe, Lord. Lord, pray that you'll just bless doctors and nurses, people who work in clinics. Lord, pray that you'll just be with them now, Lord, and pray that you'll just help those who are on the front line and stuff. Pray that, that they'll just um, be a blessing to you. Pray this in your name. Amen. Lord, Lord heaven, Father, we uh, thank you for. Um, all the teachers and the assistants and the kitchen staff. And we do pray for the parents who are taking the children back to school. We pray, Lord, that you give them wisdom. And if they do decide to take the children to school, that you give them peace, Lord, and protect them and protect the children. And for those who make the decision not to take them back to school, that they are settled with that, Lord, as well. Um, that everything is in your will and that Christian parents who know you so well will accept your will and will rest in your peace for whatever decision they make. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our children. We thank you for what a blessing they are to us. Um, we do pray for all, um, all the, the parents who've been seeking to homeschool the children, Lord, as well as working and all those who've been um, sending the children into school um, because they're key workers. Lord, we do pray for the future. We pray, Lord, for the schools as they, um, as they come back in some measure. We pray, Lord, for decisions for head teachers, for the teachers in each classroom, Lord, for, um, for all the, the workings of the school. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give great wisdom and guidance and help the children as they go back, Lord, uh, when they do. Lord, to settle well and to, Lord, just enjoy being back with, with other children and being able to um, be in school once more. Pray that they would know that you are with them. So bless all teachers, we pray in your precious name. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we've got a Heavenly Father. Lord God, with what's going on in our world today, Lord, it's quite frightening. But we know, Heavenly Father, that you're in charge. And Lord God, we pray that you would give wisdom to the government, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would help them through this serious time, Lord, of this virus. We thank you for the scientists that we've got. <coughs> we pray for patience, Lord. Everybody who, who can't wait and flouts <coughs> the laws and, 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 and doesn't take any notice, Lord, that they're putting other people's lives in danger. So, Lord, we bring you to the schools. We thank you, Lord God, for the teachers who are willing to go back, Lord, and maybe don't want to. We ask you for wisdom, Lord, for, um, for the, big, the bigger schools, Lord, and how to... How to get the children back, Lord, and 
We pray for the <laughs> parents who are too afraid to send them back because of the virus, Lord, and we know the teachers feel they could get it. And Lord God, we just pray, Lord Heavenly Father, that you will you will show them the way, Lord God, whether to send them back or not, depending on the circumstances. But we thank you and pray, Lord, that you will bless the teachers, Lord, and 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 guide them, Lord, every step of the way, so that they're not harmed, Lord, with this virus. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Father, you promised uh, in your word that when we ask for wisdom, it will be granted to us. Lord, so we, we ask for wisdom, Lord, particularly around the school situation at the time, at this time, Lord, um, the, the situation also with uh, nurseries, with colleges and, and universities, Lord. Lord, we, um, we pray for wisdom for all those having to make decisions uh, and the weight of responsibility that they, they feel upon making those decisions, Lord, uh, from the government uh, right down to every individual school, Lord. Lord, uh, we pray that you'll bless those people with the strength that they need uh, to stand in this testing time. Uh, Lord, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Anthony, over to you. Great. Thank you, Jason. And thank you to others who've led our time this morning. Good morning again, everyone. It's great to be together, even though we're apart and I trust we're staying safe and well. Let me encourage us to, to pause for a few moments now to think about God and the kind of God that he is. If you were to tell me that a, a man was going to call at our house tonight and that he was six foot five in his socks, built like a brick outhouse and with fists like a couple of tanks, I'd be very grateful for the information, but I'd want to know a little bit more. What kind of man is he? Is he peaceful or violent? Does he have a short temper or is he easygoing? Does he have something against me or is he friendly? But only when I know the answers to those questions will I know whether to lay out the welcome mat or fix more bolts to the door. Over the last few weeks, we've been asking the question, what's so great about God? Often when we answer that question, we think about God being almighty, all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-powerful, ruling over all things. And he is all of those things, uh, and a lot more. But those attributes don't always help us understand God's attitude. How does God feel towards us? Well, today, we want to explore how God is good. Of course, God is both great and good. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis includes a, a conversation between Mr. Beaver and the children who've recently stumbled into Narnia. And Mr. Beaver is trying to describe Aslan, and he says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe? said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. He's wild, you know, not like a tame lion. He isn't a tame lion, but he's good. And so it is with God. He's not only Lord, he is love. He's not only king, he is kind. He's not only great, he is good. Last week we read from Psalm 136, which begins, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. As it happens, several psalms contain that line, and there are many other references in the psalms to God's goodness. But I want us to base our thoughts today in Psalm 34, which Tim read to us. The title of the psalm tells us the situation it reflects. This is the period of David's life when he was on the run and he was being hunted by Saul, and he ended up staying with their enemies. 
And when things got too difficult, David pretended to be insane so that they got rid of him. And David then wrote this psalm about how we can trust God to rescue us. And in the opening three verses, David tells us that he's going to praise God and he invites us to join with him. I will extol the Lord at all times, he says. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And then he goes on to tell us in verses four to seven why he's praising God. And in these verses, he alternates between what has been true of him and what will be true of others. So here's David's experience in verse four. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. But he says in verse five, that can be our experience too. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. And then back to himself in verse six, this poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. And then back to others in verse seven, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. In other words, David tells us, my experience of deliverance can be your experience of deliverance. But why? On what basis does the Lord deliver us? David goes on to tell us in verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. David wants us to taste and experience God's goodness for ourselves. And so in the rest of our time, I'd like to offer three pointers about the goodness of God, which I hope will encourage us as we go into the rest of the week. I want us to think, first of all, about a good God, and then secondly, about a good plan, and then thirdly, about a good life. So let's start then with a good God. Psalm 119 verse 68 says about God, you are good and do good. God is good and he does good. God is good in himself. He's infinitely good. He's unchangeably good. God doesn't increase or decrease in goodness. God is the ultimate source of all good. We see God's goodness in creation. It's repeated on the first page of the Bible, the oceans teeming with fish and the plant life of the South American jungles and the herds on the African plains and alpine flower meadows, tadpoles and toucans, acorns and antelopes. Whatever God turns his hand to is good. We see God's goodness in his providence. As Jason reminded us from Psalm 104 earlier, that great jigsaw puzzle that God holds together. And so we experience his goodness in thousands of ways every day, every breath of our lungs, every blink of our eyes, every meal in our stomachs, every delight of our hearts. As James tells us, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. And we see God's goodness supremely in the gospel. The gospel is good news. In his goodness, God sent his son to become the sacrifice so we could be forgiven our sins. He is a good God and he does good. We see it in his creation of us, in his care of us, and supremely in what Jesus does on the cross for us. David knows that God will be his help because God is good. And we can know it too. He's a good God. And that's our first point this morning. But let's come on secondly to a good plan. It's because he's a good God that we can expect that he has good things planned for his people. Just as parents want good for their children. God wants only good for us. His purpose for us is good. Now, of course, 
that God has a good plan doesn't mean there'll be no pain. We know that from our own personal experience. And we see that in Psalm 34 too. What we see in Psalm 34 is what we see in other Psalms, which is that God doesn't promise to keep us from experiencing trouble, but he promises to be with us in it. And he promises to deliver us from it. If not now, then in the world to come. And so we see this in verse 18. The Lord is close to the broken hearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So it's not that our hearts won't be broken, David says. It's not even that our spirits won't sometimes be crushed. But that when we are broken hearted and when we are crushed, he will be near us and rescue us. And it's not even that we're passive during this time, just as David wasn't passive in securing his release from his Philistine enemies. But it's God who works through those situations to deliver us. By the time we get to the end of the psalm, we've come across words like all and never and not one lots of times. Verse three, he delivered me from all my fears. Verse five, their faces are never covered with shame. Verse 6, he saved him out of all his troubles. Verse 17, he delivers them from all their troubles. Verse 19, the righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Verse 20, he protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Verse 22, no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Why is this? Because he's a good God with a good plan. Now, given all that David had gone through, no one could accuse him of being naive or simplistic about this. David knows that good doesn't mean easy or happy. But God uses even difficulties for good. As we learn in Romans 8 verse 28, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. We see this played out in the life of Joseph, don't we, as well as in the life of David. In the last chapter of Genesis, Joseph says to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, Joseph had lived through slavery and wrongful imprisonment and separation from his family and betrayal and deprivation of all kinds before rising to a place in which God would use him to rescue an entire nation. But God enabled Joseph to take part in his bigger plan for the good, for the benefit of his people. That's an encouragement to us. We might wonder what God is doing in our lives sometimes. We might wonder what God is doing in our lives now or in our nation now or even in our world. But if we trust the good God, we can know that he'll work all things together for good. The Bible tells us that his good creation is itself groaning. But that too, Paul tells us, will one day be put right again. All natural hostilities and all supernatural hostilities will be put down once and for all. The good God has a good plan. And if we belong to him, we're caught up in that good plan, whatever we might be experiencing right now. So having thought about a good God and a good plan, let's think finally about a good life. Be good. I wonder how many times you parents have said that to your children. Maybe not all of you, because some of you, your children are just naturally so good. But if you're like the rest of us, you know how it is. You're leaving your kids with a babysitter for an evening. And the last thing you say to them before you go out is be good. Now, at the basic minimum, that means don't burn the house down. Uh, Behave like decent human beings, not wild animals. And Please don't terrorize this lovely person who has come along to look after you for an evening. You hope that they'll be good because how they behave reflects back on you as parents. 
And God's goodness has consequences for how we are to live. Be good. And so the section that begins in verse 8 of Psalm 34 gives us some clues as to what that life, that good life, looks like. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Do you hear the invitations from David in those verses? Taste, see, fear, come, listen, keep, turn, do, seek, pursue. But he also gives us a little window into what the good life looks like. It's a life which has a deep respect and reverence for the Lord, verse 9. Fear the Lord, he says. For those who fear him lack nothing. It's a life which seeks the Lord because, verse 10, while lions may grow weak and hungry, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. It's a life where, as verse 13 says, we keep our tongue from evil and our lips from telling lies. It's a life which enjoys good days because we are those who, in verse 14, turn from evil and do good, who seek peace and pursue it. In this good life, we come to God for refuge. We, we trust him. We, we revere him. We seek him. We have our hearts and our desires shaped by him. Now, we don't live this way in order to get saved because God has already brought us into relationship with himself. Please don't make the mistake of thinking we have to live this way in order to get right with God because the Bible tells us that none of us can. We live like this as a way of showing who we belong to. We seek to do good because it pleases God and because others see it. Other people spot the good life. They see that we're generous, that we're kind, that we speak the truth, that we're gentle, that we put others first. And that's why Christians of all people are to be good friends, good neighbors, good employees, good colleagues, good parents, good children, good citizens, good customers, good artists, good caregivers, good teachers. We're not do-gooders in the sense of being superior to others, but in the sense of serving others. We follow the pattern of Christ. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We serve a good God and we live a good life. Now, if that's us, says David, we can know that God will be with us in our troubles. We can know that God will be our refuge. We can be confident that God is not only great, but he's also good. And that's where I'd like to take us as we close, back to verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe you've never experienced that taste for yourself at all. Maybe you have, but it feels like such a long time ago. Let me encourage all of us where we are, even right now, to respond to David's invitation to know God and the protection God brings and the life God calls us to. A good God, a good plan, and a good life. Amen. Just before I hand back to Jason, I'm going to invite us to listen to a song about God's love and goodness. Let me encourage you to reflect on the words as you listen and use them as a way of responding with thankfulness to our good God.
Thanks, Anthony. It's, um, it's great to be encouraged and reminded that we can um, rest on God's character and, and act upon his goodness. Um, so now time just to um, draw your attention to, to a few notices for this week. Um, so house groups are continuing as normal. Well, I say normal, what's now become the new normal are virtual house groups. So there's two house groups uh, on Monday, uh, one at seven and one at eight o'clock. There's a house group on Tuesday at eight o'clock and again on Wednesday at the same time. Um, so I would really encourage you, maybe you've never been to a house group at all. You could even, I'd say, try one out by joining this week and just seeing what's going along. You could even keep yourself on mute the whole time. Work out what's going on, and um, you know I think it'd be a great a great way of um, hiding in the corner uh, if you if you're a little less confident about joining a house group. Um, also this week, uh, David will be hosting a, a quiz night via Zoom, uh, so that's uh, next Friday or this coming Friday at seven thirty. Um, so I didn't take part in the last one, but clearly it must have been a, a great success if there's another one. Um, so all are welcome to join in. There'll be a range of questions, including around for the kids. Kids, I'd advise you to practice a few mass questions beforehand uh, as David is uh, the quiz master. Okay, so um, just again, thank you for everyone who's uh, been involved in the service this morning. Uh, I'm gonna bring our time together uh, to a close in prayer, um, and then we, you can all unmute yourselves and we can say the grand goodbye together. Father, um, as we end this time together, um, I just pray that you'll guide us in our coming week. Help us to submit to you and rely on you. Lord, I pray that you'll direct our paths and give us the confidence to follow your direction. Help us to obey everything that you've taught us through your servant, Jesus. May we be firmly rooted in love and goodness in this coming week. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.